This begins the EE544 discussion on Friday, February 7th, 2014. All right, let's begin. Um, so last time I did the frequency domain circuit analysis review, and then I did the small signal model review and, and uh, found a transfer function for a simple transistor circuit. Um, so today I'm going to kind of continue this, and then that's with today it's basically going to wrap up our review of circuit stuff. Um, and then next time I'm probably going to launch into doing um, Introductions to cadence and setting up your your university account to use the the circuit design tools, um, and that will all become much more useful um, in about a month. Um, I think before then you're going to have a project from Dr. Sahid that is usually it's MATLAB based, um, and I will show you. If I remember next time, I'll show you. Everybody at university gets a free. You can get MATLAB for free. So I'll I'll just remind you guys of where to get that if you haven't already. And then um, you'll do that one, and then you'll do that project, and then after that you'll launch into a circuit design project, um, which is usually a lot more um, concerning to people because it's a little bit more difficult. So I'm going to kind of pick up where we were last time. We had the source follower. Uh, circuit, and I had done some simplifications and rearranging of elements to get to what you maybe have seen before in a text that kind of gave a simpler version or a different version from the, um, the one that comes straight from the small signal model. But hopefully you saw from that um, that they're one and the same. So this is CGS, and this is CGD. Our generator goes this way. That's GM, VI, where this value is VI. And then I have a boatload of resistors over here. So this one was RG. Um, which had to do with uh, a generator. Part of part of this generator we simplified um, based to get it to have this value VI rather than um, the value of voltage across here. So this RG was from that. Let me make that look more like an R. Um, this is RB. This is a a generator that's based on the bulk. Um, biasing. Uh, then we had RO, which is the channel length modulation resistance. And then finally we had a load resistor and a load capacitor. And our output was taken here and this end was grounded. And let's see, so this is our original load. And this is our VO point. So now I'm going to bunch all these components up and hopefully make them a little bit easier. So I'm going to make a component that's called GA. It's a conductance. And um, I guess first let me remind you what this is. So RG was 1 over um, GM. Right. You, you either remember or you're looking at your notes, right? 
Um, RB was 1 over lambda B GM. And RO was 1 over the, um, the, condu the channel conductance. So GA, remember conductances add like capacitors in parallel? Conductances in parallel add like capacitors. Let me say it that way. So this um, conductance GA, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replace all of these resistors with, and then I'm going to lump RL and CL into just a, uh, um, an impedance. And so I'm going to get this sort of, once again, simplified circuit. Simplified just because I've taken some components out. And then this is the one that I'm going to work with uh, for the rest of my discussion about this stuff. So this is GA, and then this is ZL, just a generic um, load impedance. Once again, this is VI, GM, where VI is CGD, is the voltage here. I go put my grounds in. And there we have it. That's that's the simplified circuit that I'm going to deal with. Simplified only because I've gotten rid of all this resistive junk, and I've lumped the um, impedance into this, or the the load into into this uh, generalized impedance. And the, the reason why I've done that is so that I can avoid listing all those components when I start writing mathematical expressions. Um, this is page two, not page three. So let's go ahead and calculate the input impedance. I think I've been spelling impedance wrong the entire semester. I think it's, I think it's got an A, and I think I've been putting an E there. Um, it's not uncommon, I guess, for engineers to be bad at spelling. So the input impedance is looking into the input. Um, and so the input is wherever the input is defined in the system. What is, uh, if I apply a voltage, what current is that input going to draw? And so the circuit that I'm going to look at to find this is I'm going to take this, oops, sorry, this is RS. That looks like a G. So VS and RS make up my source, and that makes for the circuit in question, this point right here is the input, and this one's the output. So when I find the output impedance, I'll look, at, look from that direction. But basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this, that's a V, not an O. I'm going to put this point at some potential Vx. I'm going to see what current is drawn into that node. So here's CGS. CGD, and this is going to be a little bit messy, but we'll get through it pretty quickly. GA again. Oops, sorry, this time I listed as RA, so that's just one over GA. And then this is my generalized load impedance. <clears throat> so here's VI again. And you can see in this case, um, this capacitor is from VX to ground exactly where VX is. So first thing I'm going to note is VX is VI. So my input is the same as the voltage that's driving this generator. So I keep leaving parts out. So that's G and VI. So I can start writing my input current that I'm going to draw from that source um, as this. Let me, let me write it and I'll sort of mention where everything comes from. So, 
VX as CGD is just the voltage drop here. Um, I'm sorry, the current drawn through this node right here, this way. And then um, VX minus VOS SCGS is the current drawn this direction through this capacitor. So it's the voltage drop times the impedance. Oh, I'm sorry, the voltage drop over the impedance. Um, I'm, I'm using you know, V equals IR, but I'm, I'm using it rearranged to, as V equals, or I equals V over R or Z in this case. Um, so this is the, the Z of the capacitor. And so that's pretty, pretty good. Um, VOS, I can, of course, figure out what that is. Um, GMVX. This, sorry, this is going to get really complicated only just for a little while. SCGS. And the reason why I'm doing it this way is to, to actually use a model where we have CGD in here. So VOS is, um, so this is the current from the source here. And this is the current um, coming this direction. So I have the current from the source controlled by VX. And then I have the current that's coming through uh, CGS. So current this direction, current this direction. They're both coming through here, and they're both going through a parallel combination of RA and ZL. So that's what VOS is. So I'm going to actually rearrange VOS a little bit. Um, let me just note this. This is IOS. Basically, it's the current. IOS is the current right here. IOS. Okay. I'm trying to figure out what to state here. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite VOS as uh, sorry, that's ZL. Last time VX. So it's now a, a basically a voltage divider. CGS. So that's just another, that's a rearrangement of this where I've taken um, this part right here and just divided it down here, um, multiplied and divide by the same thing, I think. I just looked at this, I don't know why it's confusing me so much. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. This is what I did. This is, I'm sorry, this is obvious. I took VO, this VOS um, and basically solved for VOS over here. So I, I took VOS out of this part right here and put it over here. Sorry. Little things get you sometimes. Um, and so that's just a re rearrangement of this one where there's no VOS on the right-hand side. Sorry about that. Um, and then uh, I can write IX now in terms of this VOS and this is expression that I've written up here. And it's, it'll, it'll get a little heavy handed as far as the expressionism goes. But, um, whoops, I'm sorry, this SCGD, SCGS minus And it's probably not important for you to copy all this down, so if you're not, I wouldn't worry about it because you can just look at the notes later on if you want. Um, the point is just that you can get through it. Because if, if I can do it, you guys probably have no problem doing it. So that's IX. And then obviously, um, I'm sorry, I wrote iOS. 
IX. So that's just substituting in VOS into this expression up here and collecting terms and all that kind of stuff. And so I've collected VX over here. And so now it's not too much trouble to invert this and basically find VX over IX. And there's another terrible expression. Basically just the inver inversion of this. Um, and of course there are simplifications and multiplications and that kind of things that I, that I could have done. I just did not in this case um, because I didn't want to multiply by this expression right here, 1 over SCGS um, times RA in parallel with ZL. So that is Vx over x. So it can be calculated. And part of the reason why I didn't actually carry out this multiplication here um, and you know gather terms and bring it up, up on the top is number one, because it, it wouldn't have actually really made it any neater. And number two, um, usually when you have an expression like this, uh, you're going to have simplifications. Simplification. Yeah, that's a T. <laughs> that is not a word at all. Um, simplifications um, will be incorporated um, that take advantage of relative size of components. Yeah, relative sizes, components, relative component sizes. And what I mean by that is, in this expression, say on the bottom here, if SCGS times the parallel combination of RA and ZL is much larger than 1, usually you'll just drop to 1. And then if you do that, you can cancel SCGS on the bottom and on the top and RA and ZL on the bottom of the top. And you're just left with, in that case, you'll be left with um, SCGS or SCGD plus SCGS minus SCGS plus GM. And of course, the SCGSs will cancel and you're left with an expression that's going to be 1 over SCGD plus GM. And then you may be able to, from that point, make more simplifications if GM or SCGS is the dominant term. Basically, um, you're taking advantage of the scale the relative scale of, of two components and whether you know one is significant and the other is insignificant. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do the output impedance as well because it lets me remind you of one more thing and it's much simpler. So for this one, I'm going to null the input source. And in fact, the rule is you always null other independent sources. And what that means is basically you make them a ground. Uh, uh, with the exception of the biasing sources. Um, but if you're looking at a small signal model, you've already connected all those to ground anyway. So let me complete this thing. Always know other independent sources when finding input and output impedance. So what the circuit looks like for calculating the output impedance is this. That's my input. Um, argument to be made whether I include RS or not. Um, I didn't in this case so that I can make it as simple as possible and not give you guys another expression that's ridiculous like the last one. Um, and so I have, um, this is the gate drain capacitance 
This is VI again. This is the gate to source capacitance. Of course, my generator, VIGM, and then GA. GA or RA, whichever you want to call it. And I'm leaving out the load because I'm, I'm trying to find the impedance from the perspective of the load. So um, if I include the load, then I would be finding the a different thing than the input impedance. I'd be finding the impedance at that point, including the load and the driving circuit, which is this um, uh, the source follower that I'm looking at. So again, I set VX, IX. Um, oops. So this points ground. So the first thing to note is that VI equals zero. Um, both sides of VI are grounded, so it has to be zero. So that basically takes this generator out. So I'm left with a really simple um, expression, and basically, um, Vx is going to be okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making sure that I did everything right. So it's going to be Ix. Um, Give me one second. So it's a parallel combination of GA and uh, CGS, which means that you just add them, right? Um, since they both add, like, um, this is not correct. Vx. Um, plus GA. No. All right. I'm doubting my expression that I've written here. Even though I looked at it right before this, it doesn't look right. Um, so the impedance of a of this and this is just going to be the sum. So my expression is right. Sorry. GA plus S CGS. So this is the the sum impedance of those two things, right? And so VX over IX is one over GA plus S CGS. Which is very much simpler than the other one, but the the point is not, hopefully not whether or not I did this part correctly. I think I did it right. Um, the point was to null the input source, and um, of course there's that argument about whether you include the input impedance or the impedance of the source. Um, so that's how you calculate input output impedance, and that will be important for matching uh, circuits between two different um, parts of a, of a receiver or transmitter. Um, because, of course, you want to match um, the impedances so that you get the maximum power transfer, but you also want to try to match the impedances over a broad enough range that you can um, handle the frequencies that you're going to be using. So a lot of matching circuits, well, all matching circuits are actually also filters. So um, when you start putting inductors and capacitors in a circuit, you're going to get some filtering function. So you have to make sure that your matching circuits are broad enough and precise enough to get the most out of your circuits. So that's what input uh, and output impedance are, are uh, big influences on is on the matching circuits. So the one thing that I haven't really talked about yet is that um, well, aside from matching circuits, obviously, but he's actually going to talk about that 
um, in class quite a bit, and we're going to save that for later because when I do matching circuits, um, he's going to do more traditional, or not more traditional, he's going to do more circuit analysis type matching, and I'm going to show you guys Smith charts because Smith charts are kind of fun. Um, they're a great tool, but uh, difficult to use if you don't know how to do it. But um, oh, what I was saying was the only thing that I haven't talked about was um, how you generate biasing voltages um, or recurrence in a circuit. Um, and the reason why you need them is when you're building an IC, you usually have access to um, maybe two voltage sources and probably no current sources. So an IC usually have access to one or two voltage sources and most likely a total of zero um, current sources. So that means that you can't just say I have this current source and that's my source. You have to actually generate the current that you want um, by, by building other circuits. So you won't have that. So biasing circuits, can we move the camera up that way? Circuits make it possible. Operator, can we move the, the dot cam that way? For us to, um, maybe not get the reference uh, voltages and currents that we need. So oh, there we go. Usually, when you're when you're building, say, an amplifier, you go ahead and you start solving the uh, transfer function to see how much amplification you can get, and that amplification is going to depend on your biasing levels and that kind of thing. So the biasing levels are really going to be um, well, the biasing and you know the sizing of the components, but the biasing levels are one of the um, parts that you can change in order to tune your circuit to what you need. So you need to be able to generate whatever biasing you want um, in order to get the desired, say, gain out of the circuit. Um, and in order to do that, you obviously have to generate their voltages. So let's look at a couple of simple examples of biasing circuits. So this one is a voltage reference circuit. So it's got some resistor R here. This is my output point. And I'm going to go ahead and put this guy in there. And so that's my reference. So this circuit allows you, based on choosing this value of R, to, to get some voltage that you need. Um, it may not be the best biasing circuit because it obviously has um, a lot of power drain because you're going to have, no matter what, you're going to have a current going through this thing. Whether you're going to have, whether you're actually drawing current this way or not, there's always going to be current going this way because it has to, has to drop voltage across this resistor. Um, but let's look at, look at what we have here. So if I have... Um,
So my VREF minus VGS is the VDS that I have. Is that right? No. That's not a minus sign. VREF equals VGS equals VDS. All right. That's what I'm trying to write. And of course, the current going through the thing, uh, KN, now VGS, which I'm going to write as VREF minus VTH squared. And that is going to be the same as the current coming through this resistor right here. So that's going to be VDD minus VREF over R. So now it's just a matter of wrestling this thing um, into submission. And of course, I've gone on the assumption that this thing is operating saturation, which is probably pretty safe given that VGS is equal to VDS. Um, and so if, if the reference voltage is above the threshold, it has to, it basically has to be in saturation. Um, so let me go ahead and do this thing really quick. I'm just going to split these off uh, and then multiply out this thing. V ref squared. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm the sun of my It's times VTH and plus KN VTH squared. So that's just multiplying this out and separating this into two separate um, fractions rather than a single fraction. And so, let's see, I'm just going to multiply by R and gather like terms. Sorry, can we move the document cam up? Um, so I have R, K, N, V, ref squared, K, N, R, V, T, H, times V, ref, and then plus R, K, N, V, T, H squared, minus V, D, D, and that all equals zero. So I just gather like terms. And then, of course, this is just a quadratic, so I can um, solve for V ref using uh, you know, the quadratic, quadratic equation, or depending on how good your calculator is, just use your calculator. But it gives you this interesting expression, which allows you to um, tune that reference voltage to whatever you want given the circuit parameters. Oops. VDD minus VTH. Sorry, that goes there. Minus one. So it it depends on the threshold voltage, clearly, since you have to turn the transistor on. And then on top of that, it depends on KN, which if you remember what KN, it's um, Mu n, different length. Um, there's a C O X in there somewhere, right? Well, I guess I guess I've I've called K n something different from what I've called it before, um, but it has in this version it has the width and the length in there. So the physical parameters of the of the transistor in, in its sizing as well as the mobility of, of your uh, carriers and the um, capacitance of the oxide. So by changing the, the size of the transistor, you can change the reference voltage. The time also, is of course, by changing the resistor itself, you can change the reference voltage. So it gives you a couple of different ways to actually change that voltage that you're going to look at. And so this is a really simple biasing circuit. Um, it's probably not one that you're usually going to use, but it's better than the other alternative, which is, I mean, the simplest one that you can think of is just a, a voltage divider, which, you know, if you have this thing like this, so R1, 
R2. Don't move the camera, please. <laughs> Yet. Um, so if you're using this as a, as a uh, biasing circuit, there's a number of problems. Number one, it's going to burn a lot of power because you're going to have a current going through two resistors. The other thing is, when you start pulling current this way, it's going to change the, the reference voltage more significantly than this one, than this one will once you start pulling current out this way. Um, so it will float a little bit based on the current coming out. But this, in order to be on, this transistor has to draw a certain amount of current, right? So that stabilizes it a little bit. Um, so I just say this is generally a bad biasing circuit. And when you get into actually doing your designs for your second project, um, you know, you can go and find whatever very neat biasing circuits you want. And most of the time, they'll have uh, some information to tell you how to actually choose what value you're going to look at. So, so that's a, a voltage bias. So let's look at a current uh, biasing circuit. So if you need to generate some current um, at a specific point in the circuit in order to have it operate correctly, um, this, is, this is one way that you might do it. So this might be useful for a differential pair. Whoops. Um, which usually has a current source on the bottom pulling current from, from both branches. So I have some resistor R. And transistor. And I'm going to let both these guys be connected like this. And so this point is connected to something, but we're not specifying what it is. Um, but we're going to say that it, that it can pass current and have a voltage there. And I'm going to mark these transistors as M1 and M2. Um, so from, from the circuit that I did up here, we know um, let me mark, this is the, the gate voltage right there. BG, um, So this circuit right here is actually the exact biasing circuit that I just used. Um, so this is kind of building on that. Um, so what we really want to know is what's the current going to be coming through uh, I2 here? I can write it based on the assumption that it's in saturation. Whoops, I2, I'm writing I2. Um, so VRAF minus VTH squared, uh, ignoring channel length modulation, that, all that kind of stuff. And of course, um, I1, I can write a similar expression for just based on the transistor. So they both depend on this VREF um, minus VTH square of that. So um, I can go ahead and solve for I1 over KN1 and I2 over KN2 and set them equal to each other since they both, um, after that, we'll just have VREF minus VTH squared on the right-hand side. Um, quick example of what I mean by that. Let me see. I1. Kn1 moles. 
And then the same thing is true for I2, Km2. Okay, and so I2 is now obviously, hopefully, um, I1 over Kn1 times Kn2. So we can set the current I2 by choosing um, Kn1 and Kn2 if you look at um, what they're going to be based on, on this. Kn2 over Kn1, which equals this. So this is the length of one and the width of one. Uh, not one of the transistors, but transistor one. Uh, the width of transistor two and the length of transistor two. So the ways that you, you tune this circuit are obviously by choosing this ratio, and then of course by choosing I1 in the first place, which is going to be set by the resistor, I'm sorry, I'm going to go all the way back here. It's going to be set by the resistor here uh, in this, uh, according to this right here. So according to this equation right here, you set I1, and then you set I2 relative to that <coughs> by choosing the relative width and length of those two transistors. Okay. Um, and most often, just to finish this up really quick, we let L1 equal L2 equal the minimum possible length um, because we want things to be small, and that's one way to keep them small, and also because most of the time when you're doing an IC, you don't change the length of the channel. Um, most of the time what you do is you change the width of the, of, the circ of the transistor. And so if you do that, in this case, simply choosing the ratio of width, uh, width of the second transistor to the width of the first. Um, and so with that, I'm going to wrap up today a little bit early. Um, apparently I talked super fast, which is both good and bad. Um, but let me, let me finish by saying that these are not the only biasing circuits you will want to use because they, they both have drawbacks. Um, you know, they both have this resistive part right here which you may or may not be able to get away from, but the other thing that this, you know, this particular circuit will do is the current will, will vary based on the load to some extent. And there's another version of this where you basically have two current mirrors, um, one after the other, and it's more stable um, under you know, a given voltage swing on the, on the output. So you know, obviously there's advantages and drawbacks to every circuit, so you want to when you're starting to look at biasing circuits for that for the project, you want to try and take into consideration, you know, what kind of limitations the circuit has, and what kind of uh, stress you imagine it to be under. Like, um, for the for the voltage reference, it's supposed to hold the voltage no matter what current's drawn here. Obviously, that's not going to be the case even for this circuit, but it should be fairly stable over a a good range. Of current, so you need to take that kind of thing into consideration when you're choosing those kind of things. So, um, with that, I will stop yapping. And um, if you guys have questions, I'm here. Um, but I can't make my office hours today, which are right after this. I have to I have to get off campus um, to a meeting, so um, I will have to go. But if you guys have questions right now, I'll answer them, and and we'll be done for now. Okay, thank you. <laughs>